Hello and welcome to episode 1 of Just Another F1 Podcast here on the Apex Motorsport. My name is Richard Smith and joining me for today's episode is a familiar voice on the channel. It is of course, Ryan. Hello! We have plenty to discuss in today's podcast, but before uh, before that, you may have noticed that we took a month or so break from the website and the YouTube channel. We are back now, things have changed slightly, but we're going to start making content again, which we hope you will enjoy. So let's move on to our first topic of discussion for today's podcast, which is of course the Emilia Rogmagna Grand Prix, or Limola Grand Prix for handiness. Lewis Hamilton won the race with Valtteri Bottas crossing the line in the second to give Mercedes their seventh World Constructors Championship in a row, with Daniel Ricciardo finishing third to give Renault and Ricciardo their second podium in three races. Daniel Kvyat had a great day to finish in fourth, with Charles Leclerc finishing fifth, with Sergio Perez, Carlos Sainz, Lando Norris, Kimi Reichen and Antonio Giovinazzi rounding out the top ten. The TC Vettel, Stroll, Grosjean and Albon take the non-points pen positions with Russell Verstappen, Magnussen, Ocon and Gasly all failing to finish the race. But that was Sunday. Let's go back to Saturday now and to qualifying. And to probably the star of the day, George Russell had a good session, but someone who managed to put their car in fourth place was Pierre Gasly. Ryan, what did you make of Gasly's performance in qualifying? Well, as with all things... Gasly has been quite an outstanding figure on our channel. Um, we've always kept an eye on him, and the just progress now that you see him, he's more comfortable in this Alpha Tauri than he is the Red Bull. We've we've known that for a fact for quite some time, but he really has found the limits of that car and is finally starting to understand that if he pushes it in just the right way, he's gonna reach these outstanding points, like. Qualifying is just going to work so well for him. The race, it really just depends on luck with Gasly yeah. because he can get caught up with his little head-to-head battles with Alex and as we know, that usually ends up in either one of them backing off the other. So he did really, really well in qualifying and I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens next. You have to remember that Pierre Gasly is in what would be the B team of Red Bull, which is Alpha Tauri. But this is the fifth time in 13 races that he's out-qualified Alex Albon, the, the man who replaced him uh, at the Bel- from the Belgian Grand Prix last year. I think Gasly has a point to prove. Um, it was confirmed recently to remain with Alvatore for 2021, ending the speculation that he might get promoted back to Red Bull. He's definitely proven a point. Do you think, Ryan, that Red Bull might be starting to regret not uh, promoting Gasly back to the main team? Well, I think, as Christian Horner did say, they're confident on working with Alex Albon, trying to get him used to the car. As he even mentioned himself, the car is well-suited and best, you know, maxed out performance-wise with Verstappen. So it's to meet his needs. And Verstappen, well, Albon, sorry, has shown that he is starting to understand, but not performing, showing the results. We've seen that with Pierre, and that's what ultimately got him demoted in the first place but I don't think Pierre can quite get the best out of the car whereas Albon he's moving into a team fresh out of you know what was Formula 2 for him so when Pierre already had this F1 experience getting used to an F1 car for the first time he's grown with that team and then when he was moved up the shift just wasn't right for him at that time even now I don't think if he was moved back up he would he would just go into the same old the same old same old performing really badly because he's found his comfort with the Alpha Tauri. If he went back to the Red Bull, it would just be unsettling to him again and just showing a really bad performance. You make a good point there. Someone else who performed really well on Saturday, someone who's sort of got the nickname now of Mr. Saturday, which is a little bit unfair on him because he does put in the performances on the Sunday as well, is George Russell. I qualified his teammate once more. But I think more interestingly, he out-qualified Sebastian Vettel in a Ferrari yet again. (sighs) Russell has performed really well this season on a Saturday. Vettel has struggled for Ferrari. But we know that uh, Russell will be remaining with Williams for next season. There was a little bit of speculation that he wasn't going to be keeping the seat. And I think I got quite a lot of Formula 1 fans a little bit nervous. 
What have you made George Russell's performances on a Saturday alone? On a Saturday within qualifying, he is absolutely dominating with that car. Like, for a driver who's shown that even back, we take it back here, like a good lock of months back to the Virtual Grand Prix, where everyone was in equal cars, between the drivers on, you know, Virtual Merit alone, he was performing the best. Now, put that into perspective with the real car. He's pushing at Williams to a point where it's out, out beating Ferrari powered cars, both the Haas and at times, don't get me wrong, the, the Ferrari and also the Alfa Romeo. So when you think about all these Ferrari powered cars, is it just a matter of Ferrari being a wee bit slow this year? Probably. But he's still maximizing the power because Latifi is in the exact same car and isn't able to get the best out of it as George is. So George has real driver skill. And those Saturday performances just always get near enough getting into Q2. Some weekends, sometimes not. It's just really, really good to see. Sunday's a different story, but I'm sure we'll get onto that shortly. Yes, something I found quite interesting. I'm not sure if it was certain at the, at the end of Q2, but they set a purple sector uh, in, in sector, sector one, I think it was, in a Williams that, well, I don't know for this season for sure if it's the slowest car. I think that could be the Alfa Romeo's, but one of the slowest cars on the grid. Um, Williams has struggled, but he's getting the best out of that car. Moving on to Sunday now, and we'll we'll skip uh through most of the race, and we'll go back to that. We'll just chat about the the, the end of the race and to the podium. Someone who was on the podium for the second time in three races, Daniel Ricciardo. This time he managed to do the shoey. Uh. He forgot to do it um, at the Eiffel Grand Prix in Germany. Sarah Bittbull, the Renault team boss, didn't have to get a tattoo this time. I'm sure he was glad of that. He made sure in his comments after the race to Ricardo. Ryan, what did you make of Daniel Ricardo being on the podium yet again? And for the first time in Germany, because we haven't been on the channel to discuss that since. Well, the honey badger has delivered, hasn't he? Um, well, with Daniel, like... That smile, seeing him on the podium, I think it was about time he finally got a podium once again after leaving Red Bull. He's really shown his initiative with this Renault car, pushing it to its best performance capabilities. And surprisingly, I think it was about time that Renault started showing some sort of character that they're developing into what, like, maybe one of the best midfield teams just above McLaren at the moment. But that's only due to the drivers. I'd say equal ways the cars are similar. But having him on the podium, finally regaining that shoey, I think it was one of the best things to see on TV in a long time. <laughs> yeah, that result also moved Renault up to third in the constructor standings. It's very, very tight because McLaren are 134 points. Renault have 135. Race and point are 134 as well. So really, one result can, can, can change them positions. And Ferrari and 103 aren't too far behind, but they do seem to be a little bit behind. It looks like they may even finish as low as seventh for, seven for the season. If we go back to the race um, now, and basically two drivers that we have already discussed, um, Alex Albon and George Russell, making mistakes that ultimately put Russell out of the race and Albon right down to 15th place uh, at the end of the race. Ryan, what did you make of the mistakes they had during the race? They're both rookie errors. Like, to be fair, they're not in the rookie season anymore, but they are still making rookie errors. Like, they're going behind a safety car and they're trying to push the car a wee bit too hard, trying to heat the tyres. And we just seen that, just a flick too hard on the steering wheel as they were putting a bit of power down, just sent the car in a spin. Even when Albon, it was in the restart, but as you've seen, when he went around that corner, still, they had cold tyres. He just put the power down far too early and too hard, and that's what made him spin out as well. It's just a simple rookie error, but it's surprising to see that them now not understanding that with being in the cars for, you know, nearly two years now. Um, yeah, it was uh, just a simple mistake. I think that's all it really was at the end of the day. I think one thing I did take from it was the excitement, including ourselves and the fans, for George Russell getting into tenth place after uh, the Verstappen incident, uh, which we'll get onto in a little minute, but 
Everyone was that excited to see George Russell potentially pick up his first points in Formula 1. He then crashed under the safety car. Something that we have seen before. Roman Grosjean, obviously the famous you know, Ericsson hit me moment. Um, Ericsson making a joke on that with social media as well this time around. But George Russell seemed to be getting a lot of love from the fans and support, including from Grosjean himself. But when you look back at the Grosjean incident, Grosjean got so much hate and abuse for it that you know, I wonder why is George Russell exempt from it this time round? He seems to get so much love. What's different? What does George Russell bring to the table that Grosjean didn't? I can tell you. It says, uh, let me see his Instagram page. <laughs> <laughs> um, besides from that, no, I think it is just a thing because Grosjean, as we know, we've seen him over the years. It's just constant accident. Well, instant after instant after incident caused by himself, whether that be spinning out or just crashing into a wall. You know, he's, he's been known for doing it. George, this is like near enough one of the first times he's made a mistake like this. Well, similar to this anyway. And I think it was just quite a surprise to have seen how that happened. But the support, as we know, it's the rookies, George, Alex and Lando. Everyone just had so much support and they still have so much support for those three guys. I, I, I think that's just how it is in the, in the public eye. Max Verstappen was the driver who brought out the safety car that ultimately put George Russell out of the race. It was a right rear failure. Um... It was caught very last minute on the, on the TV cameras and the replays just showed him spilling out into the gravel trap. He wasn't able to continue on the race. Was Do you think that was the moment that has really defined the season? It obviously meant that Albon had a lot of work to do to to keep Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship because uh, Mercedes only needed a couple of points. Was that the moment that decided the Constructors' Championship? Not entirely, but quite so, yes, because Alex Albon, at the moment we've seen, he deals with pressure in two ways. He either outperforms himself and does a really, really outstanding job, or he bottles it. And in this case, he bottled it. You know, if you've been told over the radio, Max is out, and you know in the back of your head, if I don't get some really good points here and positions, you know, Mercedes are just going to walk away with us today. And I don't think he had the right strategy or the right mindset at that time to even get close enough, even to like a P5 and P4 positions. So I think it just left him in a bit of a bad place, to be fair to him. Uh, the Albon incident as well, as it could be time up for Alex Albon. And someone who is potentially up against the seat for next season is Daniel Kvyat, who had a fourth case finish, which... I think went under the radar quite a bit. Um, he's obviously under a lot of pressure himself. Yuki Tsunoda is probably the favourite to get that seat. Obviously an F2 driver. It's really between Kvyat, Albon and Tsunoda for that seat if Red Bull don't keep Alex Albon on. Uh, which basically could mean Al- Alex Albon goes from Red Bull to possibly Formula E if he doesn't get a seat. What did you make of Daniel Kvyat's fourth place finish? Well, with Kvyat, yeah, I think it was just the right opportunity at the right moment in time. You know, with Gasly going out, he had the same pressure. You know, he needs to show that he is worth that seat as well at Alpha Tauri. And he did. He proved his point. He, he went and got that fourth place finish just behind Ricardo, beating the likes of, let's see, Sergio Perez, who isn't exactly the easiest to put up a fight with at the moment because he's also trying to fight for some sort of a seat somewhere in the F1 grid. So he's trying to show himself as well, you know, hey, I'm still here, guys. Don't just throw me out yet. But Kvyat, you know, I, I think he's he's borderline trying to either show he's looking to stay or he's going to, you know, eventually make up his own mind and what he's going to do. But I think that fourth place finish really put him on the, you know, the, the radar as to teams, should I say. Obviously, Mercedes getting the 1 2 finish meant that they won their seventh constructors title in a row. It was helped by Red Bull picking up no points that confirmed the title for them. They've now broke the record that Ferrari had of uh, six consecutive titles between 1999 and 2004. It also puts them fourth or uh, fifth in the list, sorry, of the most constructors titles, uh, equaling the Lotus record and just behind McLaren, uh, Williams, and Ferrari. Ferrari has, has 16 titles, 
Mercedes have a long way to catch up with them in that aspect. But probably the big story coming out of this race was comments after the race by Lewis Hamilton when he was asked a question about whether Total Wolf's future at the team was sorted yet. And Hamilton responded, I don't know where I will be next season. This is quite interesting. Obviously, Hamilton is expected to win the title. He can win it next time out in Turkey. Um, that will equal Michael Schumacher's seventh title. Schumacher is obviously someone that Hamilton looked up to um, as a youngster. Ryan, do you think there's any possibility that Hamilton wants to equal the record, but he's broke every other Schumacher record, including the amount of ones, which we'll get on to next. Does he not want to break that record because he, he feel bad because it's a person he looked up to in the past? I don't know, because if he breaks the record, he's got nothing else to look forward to in terms of his capabilities, because he's in a, a world-class winning team, and he's one of the, well, arguably one of the, well, unarguably now, I suppose, one of the best drivers in Formula One. So if he's just there racing for the sake of extending, like, a world title or a world record, there's not really much in it for him. You know, the team, they've proved their point. Lewis himself has proved his point. At the end of the day, he's going to have nothing else to push for or motivate him to push for wins and compete as competitively as he does. So... Whether he decides to just, you know, leave early before, you know, he breaks that record, I don't know. Because then at the end of the day, the only people then that's going to go after it is whoever's interested in beating Hamilton's record. And <laughs> good luck to them, I can say that much, because it's not going to be easy. But yeah, I just think it's one of those situations where you've got to decide yourself, you know, is it time? Is it time? Maybe. I think something that not confirms the Hamilton will be staying, but gives a good indication is the fact that George Russell has been confirmed by Williams. He was He's probably the person that will take over next in Mercedes, something that we have discussed numerous times on uh, on this channel. Obviously, the regulations are remaining mostly the same for next season, and Mercedes are expected uh, to win their eighth constructors title in a row, and Hamilton is expected to win another world championship, which will take him alone in the most championships. It will be interesting to see what happens near the end of the season. Hamilton could go out Rosberg style on a high, but I think for F1 fans, it will, it will leave a big cliffhanger. Everyone, everyone's waiting for Hamilton to win uh, his eighth championship, never mind the seventh this season. Um, but obviously, that's one record he could break. That's probably the big record for him, the amount of world championships. But a record, a record he broke last time out was Michael Schumacher's one record, which was 91 wins, Ham, Hamilton 92 wins, 93 with a one in Imola. Ryan, what have, what have you made of Hamilton breaking the Schumacher record? Well, breaking that record, it's just onwards and upwards from here. He is, as I said, unarguably at this point, one of the best racers in Formula 1, on paper anyways. But in the case of this record, you know, Schumacher, if he, I, I'm just throwing this out in a limb, like it's not completely the best way to put it. But if Schumacher didn't have his accident after retiring, I feel as though at some point, like Alonso, he would have made his return and possibly extended that record to a point. But it's just inevitable that Hamilton would eventually, you know, smash out that record once again because as we know he's hungry he's hungry for these these uh records but no i i have to give praise where praise is due you know he is a really good racing driver from when he was introduced in 2008 you know you gotta give props to the guy he's done a really good job i think you have to remember as well that hamilton took over from schumacher at mercedes so how much work did Schumacher do to help Mercedes get to the point where they are now? I think that's often overlooked. As the same as Nico Rosberg. I think he played a big part in the development of Mercedes as well as Ross Braun. Because we all know what happened Braun, with Braun GP in 2009. Um, I think that him, uh, Braun, Rosberg and Schumacher, I think laid the foundations down for that team to be where they are now. As well as Toto Wolff and 
Hamilton's played a big part in his driving ability and I think Bottas has played a big role as well. That bring that consistency might not always be at the level people expect, but he's done a good job for the team and done what is required of him. Uh, an interesting stat is that Hamilton has won 35% of, just over 35% in fact, of his 262 races. That's now 263 races. Um, and Schumacher done 308 races and won just under 30%. So Hamilton has done a, has won uh, more races at a less amount of time, which is quite interesting. Um, big factor, I think, could be the longer calendars at the moment um, as, as well. Schumacher, obviously, his career went on a little bit longer. Moving on to another topic now, and back to the driver transfer market. Um, Haas have dropped both drivers for 2021. That's uh, Kevin Magnussen and Roman Grosjean. There's a couple of drivers in contention for this. Um, it's Nick, Nico Hulkenberg, Sergio Perez, Mick Schumacher, Nikita Mazepin, Cal Mylott, and Robert Schwartzman. Now, we know Cal Mylott has been ruled out um, of the seat. Uh, there's apparently a list of 10 drivers. And he wasn't on it, which was a big surprise, given he was meant to get an FP1 outing. Ren, do you think Magnussen and Grosjean should be on the grid next season? That's a wee bit difficult to completely answer. Between the two drivers, preferably... I would rather have Magnussen return over Grosjean if only one could return. I'm not hating on Grosjean or Magnussen. I just think that Magnussen has a bit more driver skill and ability than what Grosjean can, you know, provide for a team. So personally, I'm not too annoyed or sad to see them go. But at the same time, they're a big part of the F1 grid at the moment. But I think those seats are just being held up you know, because there's not really much improvement shown from these two drivers at the moment in time. Where someone new could just come into the team, you know, and spice everything up, like we said, that we, like we've seen with Charles Leclerc at Ferrari, you know, everything changed. So I'll be excited to see what happens in terms of the, the driver market this season. One driver who is expected to get a seat at Haas is Nikita Mazepin. Now, if you've not been following the Formula One news, this may come a little bit of a shock. He hasn't been the most standout driver in his junior career. Um, in 2018, in GP3, he finished second with ART. Not a bad performance there. Uh, first year in Formula 2, uh, with ART, he finished 18th. And then this season, he's currently in 6th. So, yeah, he's eligible for a super license. The super license criteria has changed, which made it easier, but I think he would have still got one anyway. He brings a lot of finance to the team and there's rumours that his family can take over Haas. Haas are one of these teams where they've said in the past that if they're not progressing, they're just going to pull out of the sport. Um, one driver who is sort of highly rumoured to be that second driver, um, or probably the first driver in terms of ability next season, is Mick Schumacher. Uh, going into the season, Robert Schwartzman was meant to be the driver who was going to step up in the Formula 1 this season, was expected to be ahead of Schumacher. But the second half of the Formula 2 season, Schumacher has just been so impressive. He's been so consistent throughout the season, picking up multiple podiums. From a marketing point of view, it would be brilliant for Haas. I think Magnussen would have been good to have in the team alongside either Mazepin or Schumacher to, to sort of bring that level of experience to help the younger driver. But a Mazepin Schumacher team, two youngsters that, well, definitely in Schumacher's point, is highly rated. Do you think a young team that has one driver who has got the Ferrari backing and one's got, you know, a decent level of ability, do you think that would help Haas move up the grid next season? I think it would. Honestly, in an honest opinion, I really think it would. Haas has been rely relying on these two drivers for the last two years to sort of show something spectacular, and nothing's changed in you know the last two seasons. But I think bringing two new young guns into a, the picture, it's going to change up a few things, either in a positive or a negative way. 
because as you know, reaction times get better as you know ages are young. So I don't know. I really don't know because you know you take that risk. That risk pays off. Well done. If it doesn't, you've just made two drivers redundant over the head of nothing. So I don't know how to think of it honestly, but I really think that two new young drivers coming up from Formula 2 with that backing and the marketing capabilities. It's really going to help Haas in a financial sort of standpoint, and it could also help them in a racing standpoint too, so I'm excited. Going from two young drivers to two drivers that have got a bit more experience, Nico Hulkenberg and Sergio Perez, neither of which have a seat for next season. Hulkenberg obviously didn't have a seat for the season, but we'll get onto that in a little bit. Um, obviously, t- done a couple of races for Racing Point. Uh, he's been rumoured to take a seat at Haas. Them rumours have sort of gone away since the Mazepin news sort of broke. Um, he's done very well in the championship this season. He's only eight points behind Sebastian Vettel and is ahead of both Haas drivers, which, given he's only competed in three races, that's, that's very impressive. Um, Sergio Perez uh, was linked to Williams uh, before George Russell was confirmed. He's also linked to Red Bull. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen there. That's something I think we'll discuss at another time. But I do think it will be Nikita Mazepin and Mick Schumacher with Haas. Not what we predicted in our season predictions video, that our driver prediction video that we done a, a few months ago now. Um, don't think anyone really expected Nikita Mazepin to be in Formula 1 next season. But we'll just have to wait for the news to break. Going from two drivers that are young to a driver that is in the opposite end of the scale, Kimi Räikkönen, he has been confirmed to keep a seat for Alfa Romeo next season alongside Antonio Giovinazzi. There's been a lot of rumours recently about uh, Räikkönen staying for next year to be alongside Mick Schumacher. Don't think too many people expected Giovinazzi to keep a seat. Are you surprised at that, Ryan? Honestly, I am not quite surprised. Like, yes, Ferrari do have that seat and own that seat. Well, one of the seats, and Kimi is currently filling that, I guess, in a trade deal with Charles Leclerc. Sounds a bit funny here, but... <laughs> but no, I... I thought it was time maybe for Kimi to go. I didn't expect him to actually renew the contract, but if Kimi... Kimi's not there anymore for the, the money. He's there for the racing. It's just something he loves to do. But Antonio Giovinazzi was sort of a half surprise because, as you know, there's slight tensions in the team with success not being as high as what would want. So bringing in a, another young gun could have been, you know, Mick Schumacher. It would have been quite exciting to see, you know, one of Michael's competitors, Mr. Kimmy himself, and then his son right beside Kimmy again. You know, that would have been something spectacular to see, but obviously it's not going to happen this season. But you never know. It could happen in 2022. Never knows. Yeah, uh, I think Alfa Romeo could just be looking at the fact that there's one more year of the regulations. Alfa Romeo, of course, uh, renewed basically their ties to the team for for at least next season. Given it's not a long-term deal, I could see them potentially leave at the end of next season if they aren't getting the success that they want. One driver who I think is in, in line to get a Formula 1 seat in the future is Theo Pocher. Uh, really impressive in Formula 3 this year. He's not ready for Formula 1 just yet. He will be driving in Bahrain in Formula 2, so it'll be interesting to see how he gets on there. But I think, could the team maybe just want one more year consistency before they allow this young driver to come in? Potentially alongside Giovinazzi, I think this will be Rankin's, or next season will be Kimi Rankin's final season in the sport. Uh, for them to have an, a cyber young driver in Pocher to take over Kimi Rankinen could be nice because we have to remember Kimi Rankinen is in the cyber seat and not the Ferrari seat that many believed um, back when the deal was announced. Moving on now to another topic and it is the stars of the season so far. There's been a couple of drivers who have really stood out. Um, obviously Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen getting the big results but there's a couple of drivers who not necessarily are on the podium every race, but because of the car they have. I think we should start off with 
Le Mans a race winner, Pierre Gasly, the Frenchman in Alpha Tauri. We we talked about his qualifying performance earlier on. He's got eight points finishes this season and only failed to finish the points twice and when he hasn't had to retire, which was three times. So to only fail to finish the points when you complete a race twice is very impressive. And including that one in Monza. Rem, what did you feel whenever you seen Gasly cross that line in Monza to win the race? I thought it was, you know, about time that it happened, to be fair to him. He's he's really deserved the success he's had coming through such a terrible season last year and being demoted. I think the the guy, you know, even I remember two maybe two years ago, whenever he was sort of be- beginning his name in Formula One properly, we were like, This guy's actually pretty good and for a young driver at the time he was outperforming quite a lot of drivers and to see then now where he's performing far better than he ever has before. I think it's just really like entertaining, not entertaining, but it's a lot more enjoyable to watch a race, knowing this driver's gone through so much to see him finally getting the success he wants. So I'm happy for him. Yeah, I think last year in Brazil, when he got the podium of that drag race with Hamilton to the line, I think everyone was so happy for him to finally get that podium. But now to go on and to be a race winner, um, I remember saying back at the start of the race, um, you know, the joke was going around that the, the, the Italian national anthem playing before the race was going to be the only time it would be heard that weekend. It was wrong. The Alpha uh, the national anthem of Italy was played again. Don't think too many expected that. I, in fact, had it, and this is where people probably won't believe me, but I had a tweet ready to go out before the race um, in, in re- response to uh, Will from Formula Podcast 1, which we've had on the channel a few times. Yeah, I was quite disappointed I didn't put that out because it became it became true um, that it was the Gasly was, was going to win and the Italian national anthem played yet again. Moving on to another driver now, and it's someone who we discussed again earlier, a po- two-time podium finisher this season, Daniel Ricciardo. Ryan... Apart from the podiums, which were fantastic, what have you made of the season as a whole? Daniel's season has been quite slow this year, especially at the start. He doesn't really get on too well with his teammate Esteban Ocon. So I I can see that there's that bit of slight negativity within the team. Although in the press conferences and, you know, media, they have to get along, you know, team stuff. But I think that affected his sort of mentality at the start of the season because we've seen that he wasn't really performing too well. Then Renault brought out a little package for the cars and all of a sudden they're doing a Ferrari where they just all of a sudden start to perform a lot better and start creeping up the grid. Hmm, sounds fishy. (laughs) But no, Ricardo has really come out to himself once again and is starting to show what the Honey Badger can do in Formula 1 and provide these good results and obviously a tattoo along with it. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right in what you're saying about it was a slow start to the season because when we originally planned this podcast, we didn't even have Ricardo in our list of stars of the season. And so when we looked at the driver standings, I see him sitting in fourth place, 10 points ahead of Charles Leclerc. We thought we need to discuss him because he's got two podiums in a Renault a team that, to be honest, wouldn't be expected to challenge the podiums. Although, if you look at the Constructors' Championship now, they're the third fastest team. If something goes wrong up ahead of them, what you did for Red Bull, they, they would be the team that you'd expect to see in the podium. Uh, moving on to another driver, and it will be Ricardo's teammate for next year, Lando Norris. I think he's improved a lot since last season. Um, obviously, podium first race of the season, which was, which was fantastic to see. He's engaged with new audience online over lockdown with Twitch. He's got a little bit of stick recently uh, for comments he made about Lewis Hamilton uh, uh, breaking Schumacher's record. Brian, what have you made of Landon Norris this season? Landon Norris is actually, in my personal opinion, he's sort of underperforming, and that's going to be a shock statement. Yeah. Because he's in a car that 
has shown great improvements in terms of you know mechanical capabilities within the, the actual car itself. We've seen they've taken that Renault engine and they boosted it and they were performing so well at the start of the season. And yes, at the start of the season, I would completely back every single person saying he's a really good driver. Now we're starting to see the opposite sort of trickle down now as Renault are starting to come through themselves and push their car in front of them. And we're starting to see not so much mistakes, but a lack of enthusiasm to go for races. At the start of the season, we hear Team Radio, Lando is bubbly, energetic, excited. Now we're starting to see sort of negative and harsh comments come out over Team Radio, where he's starting to become a bit like Kimi Räikkönen, where he doesn't want to interact with the pit wall whatsoever. So in the terms of where I said underperforming, I think that's where it's coming from. It's the negative attitude that's slowly developing throughout his racing, which is starting to actually affect his results overall. So although I back him thoroughly as a, as a good driver, I don't think he's starting to perform as well as he could be. I think you make a good point there, because when we think back to the first race in Austria, that amazing last lap to try to close in Hamilton, which I still, seven. yeah, which I think is cool down. It's one of the best moments of the season so far. Then the following race, that last lap overtake, I think of him race one of the racing points. I think it was Perez. He was making a habit of these last laps being fantastic. Could scenario seven being banned or these party modes as they're called being banned have had an effect and maybe not given him the advantage that he had in the final few laps of a race. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. He's not getting the exact same performance boost at the end of a race when he needs it the most. Instead, he's having to progressively bring it out throughout the race, whereas he's used to being, you know, all calm, 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 and then near the end of the race, the adrenaline's going, I might be able to do this, I might be able to do this. The adrenaline gets going, the power's delivered, and he goes for it, and he does it. I think now that's sort of what's bringing him upon this negative attitude because he's realized he doesn't have this energy at the end of a race anymore. He's too focused on managing so much more throughout the race, trying to deal with the strategy that's coming to him and then what he's trying to do out there. You know, it's completely different. One thing on paper is one thing completely different to what's actually happening. So it's it's a hard one to, to break a deal with Lando at the moment, with me personally anyway. Now moving on to driver, I think we're both excited to talk about. It is the super sub himself, Nico Hulkenberg. Someone that I don't think either of us really expected to be talking about this season. Um, whenever the teams announced who the reserve drivers were, uh, Racing Point, uh, I think we're just going to use the Mercedes um, reserves of Stoffel van Dorn and Esteban Gutierrez. Gutierrez was meant to take over from Sergio Perez at the British Grand Prix when Perez tested positive for the cover for the coronavirus. Then there was an issue with a super license, and then upstep Nico Hulkenberg, who was meant to be there as a as a pundit for German TV, uh, <laughs> he got in the paddock very late, and then he didn't get to start the race. That was a big disappointment. Uh. He had a very good qualifying um, for not being in the car. But then the following race, I, I remember right that he started in fourth place in qualifying, which was fantastic to see. And then he had a, he had a great finish as well, well in the race. Ryan, how glad were you to see Nico Hulkenberg back in Formula 1 this season? Oh, I was ecstatic. I, I've always backed Nico Hulkenberg as a driver, even when he was at Renault. He's just one of those drivers. I think it's only because of the nickname, the Hulk. You know, it's just something you just want to go, I'm the Hulk. I'm going to come in and smash every other person's car on the track here and win. But no, Hulkenberg, for a guy who said he would never wear pink, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think he suits the pink now when yeah. we see him getting really good, you know, really good race out of it. I think I think even himself he agreed at one point I can't remember that he he did look good in the pink I think he said yeah but no uh, I I was so glad to see him back I think you know being told 
like imagine just being told it's almost as bad as people you know in the whole you know situation we're in at the moment being told you have to leave your job that was essentially how he was told but before anything like this happened and now he's come back and he's proven a point that you know he shouldn't have been kicked out of the team yeah. yes it made way for a younger driver who needed a seat at some point because he's not going to sit there as a test driver forever at mercedes but the hulk oh i was so glad to see him come back and he came back with a bang to be fair to him for a guy who didn't have much time in a race car this season at all he has done exceptionally well i have to give it to him yeah he certainly has and he's someone who has always been grateful for that opportunity uh to be back in the car you know i had to laugh at the first race he had to borrow I think with Lance Stroll's spare race suit um, and he had a plain race helmet and then he got one made for the second race weekend, the 70th anniversary Grand Prix where uh, Perez was obviously out again. He obviously had a bit of time in between the two races, uh, still a little bit uncertainty whether he would take part in the second uh, race around Silverstone, but then it was the Eiffel Grand Prix, his home race. He said that whenever the calendar came out at the start of the season, he was quite disappointed not or not when the calendar, the new calendar was released. Um, he was quite disappointed to not get a chance to race at his home Grand Prix. He didn't even get a phone call, you know, on the on the Friday morning. It was something like eleven a.m. on the Saturday. Then he went straight into qualifying. He had to use his Renault helmet, uh, which I found quite funny because it did not suit him in the car at all if, if we're, it was a real example of a stand-in driver but what a performance in the race he's obviously now sitting um, just 8 points behind Sebastian Vettel on the driver's standings he's only done 3 races and he's now linked to a Red Bull seat it's really between him, Perez and then Albon as well Do you, can you see Nico Hulkenberg being in Formula 1 again next season? I wish I could say yes. I honestly really do wish I could say yes to that. He's a, he's, he is a driver who has proven a point, has made a statement and said that he would love to come back. But in the way things are going at the moment, it's quite hard to get an older driver to come back when more younger drivers are looking to come up into the, the bigger sport. Obviously, there's an exception, and I think we're going to talk about that next. But Hulk, I would love to have seen him come back for next season, even even if it's even if it is with Haas. To be fair, if it's with Haas, I'll take it. He's a driver who deserves a seat at minimum back into the sport. Yeah, talking about that driver who is definitely not on the younger side, uh, Fernando Alonso. Back at Renault next season, obviously Daniel Ricciardo is moving to McLaren because Carlos Sainz is moving to Ferrari because they let go of Sebastian Vettel, who's now going to Aston Martin, which is racing point this season. It was just a chain reaction. But Renault were trying to get Fernando Alonso to take part in the young driver's test, which doesn't sound right at all. Fernando Alonso, a two-time Formula 1 world champion, taking part in a young driver's test. And that's designed for drivers to have had less than two championship races, never mind two uh, world championship titles. Several teams have expressed their opposition to uh, Alonso taking part at the end of the season test. Uh, we believe that McLaren, Ferrari and Racing Point are amongst those teams. Um, there is rules that do allow for a driver who's not raced in two years to, um, to get time in the car, but this is really only for sort of reserve drivers. Um, and there's a lot of young Renault drivers uh, like Oscar Piastri, Guan Hujou and Christy Lungard who may be missing out on the opportunity, who may not get this opportunity if Fernando Alonso is blocked. Ryan, do you think Fernando Alonso, given his experience of Formula 1, yes he hasn't been in it for a little while, but do you think he should be allowed to take part in a young driver's test? I don't think he needs to. It's not so much that he should be allowed to or whether he shouldn't. I just don't think he needs it. Because as you know, we're going to get a long period at Spain next season for testing. And I think it doesn't take too long to get the grips with the car, especially when you've been driving used to Formula 1 cars before in the past. 
you know, he's, he's only been gone out for what, two, two, three seasons? I can't remember exactly, but it's not going to take him long to remember how to flick a few switches and change a few gears, you know, around a track. Most of the tracks he knows and remembers. Yeah. Obviously, we're getting, I think, two new tracks next year, hopefully. And I just don't think he needs the, the testing now because he's going to get it later and it's going to be no problem with him whatsoever. Yeah, obviously, since uh, he left Formula 1, he's went and tried uh, to win the Indy 500. Um, failed to qualify in 2019 and 2020. He didn't have the best of times. Uh, but moving on to a team now uh, that is technically a new team for next year. It's Aston Martin. They're going to be the Racing Point team, just rebranded. Uh, Lawrence Stroll uh, recently put uh, bought a large stake in Aston Martin. Along with Toto Wolff, the Mercedes boss, uh, he bought a share that was, at the time, worth about 5%, but I think the following day, that was reduced to 1% um, or something along those lines. Uh, Mercedes are looking to take a 20% stake in the business. We obviously know the one Stroll and Toto Wolff are, are quite close friends. Ryan, do you think this could potentially lead to Aston Martin become, becoming a Mercedes junior team? Possibly. I agree with that statement <laughs> in total because, you know, Mercedes, they have their big team. Mercedes are partnered with Racing Point, soon to be Aston Martin. You know, they might be thinking here, let's work on a little deal. Over time, we'll eventually come to this. But how about let's do what Red Bull does? You know, have the main team and have a sister team, which I think is probably one of the best ways to go about the situation. But at the same time, Leaves a whole lot of grey areas with regards to Mercedes and Aston Martin being two completely branded teams, whereas Red Bull, it is the whole Red Bull brand essentially just slightly rebranded compared to a whole rebrand, essentially. But no, it, I think it would be nice to see the two teams being sort of partnered or even a sister team, as they call it, with the Alpha Tauri and the Red Bull. Yeah, it'll be fun to see how that whole situation goes round with Mr. Lawrence. Big, well, Big Daddy Lawrence Stroll <laughs> and Mr. Toto Wolf. Yeah, I think uh, if Racer Point or Aston Martin for next season or in the future to become a junior team uh, of Mercedes, say in 2022, I think the clearest indication of that maybe happening is if Mercedes keep Hamilton and Bottas for another season. If George Russell doesn't move up to Aston Martin at the very least, I think, well, we've discussed in the past, we, we in our uh, 2021 driver predictions, I think we said that he will be in the Mercedes for next season. We know that's not going to happen. He he should get that step up at the very least because when you look at Red Bull and Alpha Tauri, there still is a difference, a big difference in terms of ability. Pierre Gasly is doing a, a lot to try to close that. He's one point behind Alex Albon in the driver's standings, but they're ninth and tenth. But we, all, we always know from the start of the season the racing point is last year's Mercedes, um, and the cars will remain mostly the same for next season. So it'll be interesting to see if racing point can use Vettel and help develop and potentially give George Russell a race winning seat which isn't a Mercedes, but is linked to Mercedes. Moving on to the final topic now of today's podcast, and that is going back to the race in Imola. It was a slightly different format. It was only two days instead of the traditional three. Um, it meant the teams had more time, or had less time, to, to sort out strategy, and they had to think more on their feet. Um, we know it, it didn't really cause too much of a difference with strategy with, I think, the big talking point being Lewis Hamilton being able to put under the virtual safety car, which ultimately won him the race. It helps save costs for teams. It, it would make race weekends cheaper for fans, but you made a good point earlier, Ryan, that will up the prices. Do you, can you actually see that happening? If the race organisers think, right, they're only going to have fans in here for two days, do you think Formula 1 will allow them to raise the costs? Oh, 100%. There's no guarantee that it won't happen, but there is a slight guarantee that it could happen. You know, 
in terms of business, you know, you still got to make money. And if they're not having three days worth of fans coming in and out, generating a revenue, you know, there's also, think about it, all those little marquee stalls and stuff, they're going to be there for two days instead of three days. So they're losing revenue on that as well. So I think ticket prices are going to slowly rise. They'll test it out, see what way it works out, whether more people come still with it only being two days, you know, less time or whether people might still prefer the three days. Obviously, at the moment, we've seen it creates sort of a a different sort of a race layout because more, more things go wrong. Some things can go right. can be exciting. But the overall sort of view of it being two days and financially, for us, the spectators, the viewers, it's going to become more costly. And I can't say enough how likely that is going to be. The, the current format, when you include Formula 2, Formula 3, the Porsche Super Cup, and any other feeder series that they bring along, it's quite a long weekend. There's a lot of action. You, know, for, for my trips to Silverstone for the British Grand Prix, you're up 4 or 5 in the morning to travel to the circuit, and there's times you're not back to, the, to late on. If you stay for the concert, you might not be back to your hotel room till about half 11 at night, and then back up 4 or 5 the following morning. If they do condense it down to two days, it might make the Saturday and Sunday even busier than it already is because all the practice from uh from Formula Two and Formula Three, you know, happens on the Friday, the qualifying happens as well. If that moves to Saturday, there's a potential of practice qualifying and a feature race for Formula Two happening, it's the same as Formula Three, and then they have another race on the Sunday. The Sunday would remain largely the same. The Saturday would be very busy. Now, I wonder if that did happen, could they potentially move something to the Sunday? Because between usually the end of the Porsche Super Cup and the start of the Grand Prix, there's about two hours, two and a half hour wait, which for a spectator can be quite long. Ryan, do you think there could be a potential that they move Formula 1 qualifying to a Sunday morning? Um... We've seen it happen in the past in Japan last season, for example, whenever the, there was bad weather. Um, do you think if they did move qualifying from a Saturday to a Sunday, it would just turn the Saturday into a Friday practice day and it defeats the whole purpose of it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't like to see that. You know, maybe every so often, you know, shake things up a bit, but it just creates a hassle with everything that goes on. Like at times having that qualifying day shifted, it creates a bit more stress for the teams having to try and get everything in the one day. But it also means then the cars are being overworked and there's more likely reliability issues to happen. Because if you think about it, those engines are being pushed to the max on qualifying. They then get that day sort of break for the mechanics and the engineers to go looking at the car and make sure everything's all right. Paired, where if they're going through having the qualifying and near enough the race on the same day, it can create a lot of issues going on, you know, mechanically. That's the way I see it anyway. In terms of spectators and the viewing sort of experience, I think that might not be the best idea as well. Just for the fact, you know, everyone's used to this format and it works really well. So why change up something when it's already going good is, I suppose, the easiest way to put it. So I think that's going to wrap up today's podcast. Uh, it was quite enjoyable, this one. We covered quite a lot of different topics. Uh, comment below anything that you want to discuss in future podcasts. And leave your thoughts below on last weekend's uh, Imola Grand Prix. Uh, make sure you check out our website, uh, www.apexmotorsport.com and follow us on all our social media, which will be linked in the description below. Um, but that is going, as I said, bring this podcast to an end. Thank you all so much for listening and hope to see you all in the next one. Goodbye.